Uh, it is uh, uh, metamorphosizes tremendously over the last four years. I have 162 World War II and Korean era veterans coming to this event. Most of them World War II fellows, only a handful of Korean veterans have signed up to be part of the event. And uh, what we've been doing here for the last couple of days, we've been building our sandbag bunker. Uh, a lot of the other reenactors have been setting up their tents and equipment. Uh, many of the uh, ambiance, if you will, sandbags and uh, uh, World War II memorabilia that uh, goes back, uh, uh, maybe even some of it back to World War I. So we've been very, very busy here the last few days. And even though the event is uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, this event for the most of the reenactors and certainly the, the staff, Staff, it goes on all year round. We have meetings all year round. Um, myself personally, I put over a thousand hours into this event every year, and many of the people uh, on the board do. Um, uh, but uh, for the reenactors, come here a few days ahead of time, set up their uh, their encampments, and it, so when the public gets here on Friday and Saturday, they don't see all those things that go around behind the scenes. Uh, for example, the veteran tent, which is right across the way here. Um, Myself and about six other individuals set that up yesterday in a, in a three minute rainstorm with uh, very high winds. It was knocked down. So at two o'clock today, we are going to be trying to write it back up. And um, it, it's, an, it's essential because we have to keep Talvas out of the sun. When you're 90 years old, you can't tolerate the conditions of the sun on your body. This is a replica of a beach bunker on Utah Beach taken from a photograph. We try to replicate the original shape and uh, size of the uh, bunker on, uh, they had on Utah with sandbags and a roof with camo netting and such. And we have uh, all the uh, signal lights and everything they had inside. So did they use this for shelter while they were there? Yeah, well it was kind of, face, it was right on the beach facing the water. So far up, almost to the uh, well, on the seawall. On the seawall, and it would uh, they'd have communication because they would the, the beach battalion brings in all the shipping, and that coordinates all the uh, LSTs and uh, everything coming into the beach. It's landing and unloading. So you're essentially using burlap bags, putting sand in them, and piling them up. Yep. Yep. Off the original. I don't have the original photograph with me. I don't know if Eric does or not. But uh, yeah, we got like 300 some sandbags here. That sounds like a warm job. It's not too bad now with the breeze, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of work. What we do here is we try to represent both an infantry company and the headquarters element that belongs to it. This year I'm playing the company commander, uh, Greg Stapleton, who's from our, other yard, our large unit, Charlie 115, we alternate, so he'll be wow. company commander next year. So this, these guys come together once a year to form essentially a full rifle company, plus or minus numbers. So we have three rifle platoons and a headquarters detachment to kind of give the people the impression of what a whole rifle comp what an entire rifle company would look like. Of course, one day we hope to have weapons company here so then we actually have the full representation. So what would a service person, what would his day be like in the World War II? Well, just like anywhere else in the Army, it starts with Reveille. There would be a training schedule or a duty schedule, if you will. They can tend to be synonymous. Duty, routine work around the camp, training if there's any particular training going on. Now, in the case of the sausage camp, this is where you lived. You did a lot of administrative stuff here, but then you would have a field training area you would either march out to on foot or you would truck out to by vehicle and conduct any collective or individual training there. And that ranged, really it ranged from individual training from weapons qualification to uh, training any new recruits that have come in. They may have gone through basic training but there's always the orientation to, right. to bring into the unit. And then collected training, getting the unit ready for the battle tasks it'll be performing in combat. I'm from Arlington, Virginia. All my people that you see here today are from St. Louis, Louisville, Kentucky. We've got some people coming in from New York, more people coming in from Northern and Southern and Central Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, Central Maryland, Pennsylvania, Ohio. So we pretty much cover uh, 
a, a very wide area. What brings you back here? The love of history, the camaraderie, um, the chance to actually form a, a true infantry company as close as we can get it and work together with some really good, I call professional folks that try to put a lot of effort in trying to replicate the Army of that time. And we try to take, give the vets a good snapshot impression of what their life was like back then. And we try to educate the public as best as we can too. Nothing's perfect. This is a this is a work in progress every year. Mm -hmm. So whatever everything we learn, we bring forward to the following year. I can tell you at the beginning, there was always since you got four or five different units coming together to form this, there's always a little bit of tension amongst you know and, and uncertainty amongst folks. But I'll tell you, as the years have progressed, we've grown together. We're pretty tight, and we just keep getting better each year. Gosh, I've been reenacting. Uh, I don't know. 12, 15 years, I guess. I'm, I guess I'd have to think back on that. <laughs> Let's say 15 years. So where do you, you go to different places around the country or? Well, um, most of what our unit does is regional. We're a unit from Kentucky and Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So we do almost all of our events down there. But this one up here is a major national event. So it's one that we try and make every year. We haven't missed it for 10 years now, I guess. At least some of our guys have been up for this one. Uh, this is one of the big ones that everybody wants to come to. What do you want people to take away from walking around here and seeing the battles and all that? You know, the, the, the thing is that we do this for is just to, to remember what these guys did. You know, it's a, it's, it's a personal thing with a lot of us. Uh, we have family that served, uh, particularly uh, in my case with the 29th Division. And we just got to remember, we got to pass on to the next generation, keep it live, because they're the, they're the generation that has to put hands on, they have to see it. They don't like to read about it in a book as much as uh, some other generations did. And this gives them that hands on, they can feel it, they can see it, they can hear it, get a little bit of the taste. Um, by no means do we ever suffer what they suffered, do we go through anything like what they went through, but we can at least remember what they did and try and pass it to the next generation. Got my start in 1961 in the uh, Civil War Centennial. I was a very, very young teenager. That started my love for living history and I've been doing it ever since. So did you do Civil War for a while? I started a Civil War uh, in 1973. I joined a uh, Revol Revolutionary War unit and uh, served uh, through the Bicentennial years. And my first love has always been World War II. The town I grew up in included some men who went ashore on Omaha Beach with the 29th Division and that was uh, a real love for me. Well, perpetual vacation. I'm retired now. Okay, but at one point you were to I would take time. Yeah, I would take time. I would, I would time my uh, leave to uh, the World War II or the Civil War events that I wanted to attend and go to. Them. So how do you rate this one? Uh, it's a very good. One. Yeah, it's a very good one. There's a, a, a large number of people who come here, and many of them do a great job presenting a credible impression of uh, soldiers in World War II, both Allied and Axis. seen a growth in uh, in an area but again this is an expensive hobby and you have to commit a lot of money and time to it uh, we are you to get new people from time to time but you gotta buy uniforms and uniforms uh, weapons uh, uh, shoes uh, and it can it can take it can put a bite in the budget now, I talked to somebody last year that was a Civil War uh, reenactor and he switched to World War two because he said it was a little easier and you got more toys so would you <laughs> that, that, I would say that's a fair assessment plus uh, uh, you know to be period correct some people that push the authenticity to a certain point I like the convenience of uh, clean toilets and hot showers and hot food <laughs> which you find in World War two <laughs> Could carry about uh, six guys in the back. Um, it's just a kind of a mobile command post for a uh, larger units. So, is this a replica? It is a replica. Um, it's built off of 
a uh, pickup truck chassis. World War II reenacting since uh, 2003. And prior to that, I still do. I've been Civil War reenacting since 1981. Okay. So kind of jump back and forth between <laughs> widespread time frames. Yeah. So why why German soldier? You find it interesting? Or? Uh, yeah, I do. The the Wehrmacht uh, was pretty much the common soldier that made up the bulk of the German army, they were the, 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 the German people as I always call it, and um, I mean, you know, I always kind of liked seeing what what they had to go through versus any other type of military arm that the German put out. So how is the German soldier's life different than, say, an American soldier? Stricter, it was a lot stricter military sense-wise, and uh, they had to learn to work with lesser materials, food, clothing, and what have you. They, they didn't have the uh, generous government constantly overwhelming them with supplies and uh, you know, material, so it was good to have a, get an idea of they work with more uh, meager you know, uh, provisions. And to do more with less. Yes. There you go. Well put more with less and, and it, I've come from a German background I had you know a good chunk of our family is from Germany and, and uh, you know, it's an opportunity to get them a little closer to what the Germans had to deal with figuring what my parts of my family had to deal with at the time mm -hmm.